not about looping. It's my main thing, but I use it as a tool to play my songs. To have an interesting song, you need a song structure, and that's not just stacking layers upon each other. What I've seen from looper people, I saw that their build-ups took very much time. So I thought I need to find a way to do this faster. That helped me push the limits of what you can do with loops. As a kid, I had a carton box drum set and I started having lessons at 10. When I had to pick a study, I thought if I'm busy with music all the time, then probably I need to go to a conservatory. So I went and uh, studied and then in 2008, I finished at the Royal Conservatory in The Hague with the masters and been making music ever since. I used to have this band and there was one gig where I only had to play with the MC. So I thought maybe I'll try something with this program called Ableton. At that moment I was very much into this track called The Healer. And I thought, well, maybe I can play that track and build up these loops. My friend Boss saw that and re started recording it. And from that moment I started this Beats Unraveled series which was for me basically like an investigation process on electronic-based music, how to play it live. It was the perfect promo plan, if it would have been a promo plan, but it wasn't, it just happened. People picked it up because they knew the songs and the whole thing spread quite fast. One is for J. Dilla, 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 Dilla. We got emails from people saying, hey, can't you come and perform this song here? And I thought, that's cool, but if I want to play live, I cannot do it with these covers because otherwise it's going to hunt me forever, you know? I always was making music of my own. It was mostly uh, hip hop beats. I would sample a record, put some drums to it. But millions of people were doing that. And then when I was doing this series, I finally found what was me, you know, when I thought of making my own music in this way. It took a long time to be able to write in that way. Also the music that came out, I had to sort of get used to like, is this the music that I'm making? Is this what I'm into? It felt very personal all of a sudden. I took a year off to release all the music and then started touring again. I feel like if I want to have a sustainable long career, I should follow my own path. And that's the more difficult path because, you know, people know you maybe from the bits unraveled but your own stuff you know they don't know so much so it's, it's starting more from the from the bottom again but uh, I think it's gonna be worthwhile in the end you know to but it's just perseverance I guess and just keep on going
I live in Utrecht. It's in the center of Holland and I've been living here already since 2000, so like 18 years. It has a very friendly character and uh, I love that it's a big city, but it feels like a small town. I'm part of this sort of collective called Kytopia. We're in this old building that used to be the music venue of Utrecht. Far before that, it used to be the monastery. We're sort of monks ourselves, you know, everybody's in a studio, isolated from the rest of the world making his music. So I think it's a good circle that came around. We can always knock on each other's doors and say like, hey, can I borrow some microphones? Or you want to listen to this track I'm making because I'm stuck, you know, with this idea. I haven't really been into another place that's like this. It's all quite low profile here, but it has a charm to it, and that's maybe better than a clean, sober, concrete studio. I'm not sure how many instruments I have in my studio, but probably somewhere in the thousands. There are different reasons why I buy an instrument. Sometimes it can be how it looks, like if it looks great, that I think that it's gonna sound great. And sometimes it's really because I have a certain thing in mind. I got Vietnamese instruments, Indian instruments, African instruments, and it doesn't stop with instruments. It also has objects. If it makes sound, it sort of belongs to the percussion world. I have a roll of baking paper in my studio. I use it sometimes, you know. When I create a track, I'm not specifically thinking of how to perform it live. The good thing is, if you don't do that, you force yourself to come up with solutions if you have a start of a song, it already says something like, okay, I think it's gonna be about this. Yeah. I'm trying to make a certain sound world for that track. Mostly starts very much within the laptop, using plugins or synths. And slowly I'll add acoustic sounds on it. Sometimes it works to just try a lot of stuff. So I layer lots of ideas on my track and then I start working my way down, you know, like, okay, this I don't like, I throw it away and, oh, this actually sounds great. I cannot just only play the dry signals and then start all the processing of those signals later. Immediately it's uh, part of the track. So if I have a, maybe an acoustic sound, I'm immediately seeing what cooler sound I can get with that, you know, or how to fit it into this mood. With the downside of sometimes me losing the focus on what should happen next in the track, because I got lost in this sound designing world, and it's like, okay, this is nice, but what do I need now? If I have the whole thing finished, then I'll turn it into the live version. So that's like the second step. I start building the whole skeleton of the song within Ableton and then rehearsing the routine of playing all the ingredients that are in the track. One, two, three. All the recordings, all the small loops I make, their lengths are determined. I stop playing when I know now the looping is done and then it starts playing. And in the meanwhile, I can already start playing the next thing.
so I never stop a recording. I don't need to do an action in between, it goes automatically. The first few concerts that I did, I felt like my head was exploding because of all the things that I needed to think about. I felt very alone because suddenly now my bandmate was a computer and not a real person. But this routine, it became easier and easier. At one point you don't really need to think about it anymore, your hands just go to the next thing without thinking. Over time a lot of stuff already happened on stage, so a lot of things went wrong and then you find out, okay, you know, it's not the end of the world, you know, and I can fix this later, you know, and then... Um, so you get more comfortable and then you start enjoying it more. Everybody appreciates craftsmanship. There's hours and hours in every music that's out there. The fact that we put a lot of time in it is not that special, but if you see how it's made, you have more appreciation for it. I think the fact that I have all those instruments with me and that you see, ah, that thing produces that sound, you know? You can connect more to it, I guess. If I play one wrong note, it's gonna be there all the time. So I can understand that it seems fragile. It is in a way, but also not if you train it hard enough. I mean, yeah, it's a lot of work. That's what it is, I mean, but, uh, yeah, why shouldn't you work hard on something you, you want to do, you know? I mean, if you're a lazy artist, what, what, what good is it, you know?